been there. In this context, what's important is that Snellbridge provides almost uh, marriage guidance, is probably the best way to put it. So sometimes we work with communities when they're talking to developers about investing in something, and sometimes we work with developers creating a structure that communities can invest in. Um, and sometimes, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm also happy to say, we work with um, uh, communities and developers who have got into difficulty as a project has gone on through its life, and there's a bit of restructuring required. Um, so we try and make sure that uh, everyone is happy at the end of that process. Um, I want to talk about ownership models, and specifically going back to what Chris Morris was saying this morning about the, the good practice principles in Scotland. We have, um, as he said, we have a kind of guideline that uh, Scottish renewables have signed up to that says 5,000 pounds a megawatt. Um, that's actually in the process of being revised at the moment, so watch this space over the next uh, six months or so. Um, but in addition, there's this concept of shared ownership. Now, as the uh, support schemes have come off in the UK, the feed-in tariff, the renewable obligation certificates, and things like that, uh, 5,000 pounds a megawatt per annum has started to look like a pretty big number. And so what we're seeing now is we're seeing uh, that the shared ownership schemes are becoming more popular. So why is that? Well, here's a summary of what we mean by these different schemes. Um, the bottom right there, traditional community benefit, that's your 5,000 pounds a megawatt. Communities love that. Um, it's very easy to understand. Shared ownership is the, is the other three. So starting at the top left, proper shared ownership, as I would call it, is the community is given an option to buy up to a certain percentage of a wind farm. And that's the equity of the wind farm. Um, and the community then has to go and raise some money. Um, and they, you know, we'll talk about the sources for that money. But then they can invest in the wind farm and they will receive dividends, they have to service their debt, and any surplus that's left over, that community organization can spend on local projects with local people that are very visible, great for building support. Um, that's a really nice model. Um, shared revenue, slightly different model, because rather than being a shareholder in the project, the community receives a percentage of the revenue. So it's almost like the... Um, pounds per megawatt hour tariff type of deal. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages to that, but obviously from the developer's perspective, that's starting to look a lot more like a cost now. That's starting to look like rent or an O&M agreement or, you know, it's a cost line. Whereas with the shared ownership model, that's a nicer model because you're partners, you're genuine partners. So the community isn't a cost to your project, it's actually a co-beneficiary and a co-investor. Um, the Bottom left model there, split ownership, is a horrible model, and please never do this, which is the idea that the community owns a turbine and they want to be able to put you know, their community name on the bottom of the turbine. But if you have a four turbine wind farm and that turbine is the community turbine and these three are owned by somebody else, then what do you do about splitting you know, the warranty agreement? What do you do if that turbine goes down and the other ones don't go down? How do you then split the revenue at the end of the period? There's just all kinds of stuff that springs up. It's a nightmare to finance. It's a nightmare to structure. You'll spend millions on legals. It's an awful structure. It offers no advantages over the, over the top two. Um, I wanted to put it there so that you don't do it. <laughs> so nothing's perfect in this world. Um, there's a lot of red crosses in all of them here. Fundamentally, if we, let's, ignore, let's ignore the bottom left because it's so terrible. Fundamentally, with the other three, what you're looking at is different levels of risk being transferred between the community and the developer and different levels of benefit, right? So risk and reward are always balanced. We're, we're pretending we're on the efficient frontier, to put it in corporate finance terms here. So traditional community benefit, it's likely to be the lowest returns for the community, but it's very clear, it's very easy to understand. People love it because they can, they've got a number in their head and they can equate that to the number of fancy park benches they're going to have in the local community, right? It's, it's simple, it's easy. It's pretty hard when you're looking at a shared ownership model to visualize what 6.04% of the dividend stream on a 20-year basis is going to be. I mean, that's not something people really understand. So the education that's required is quite a lot. From the developer's perspective, that traditional community benefit thing, is a, that's a nightmare, right? That's an extra cost line what, what if you have a bad year? What if, what if, you know, yes, you might finance on a P90, but what if you have that one year in 10 where you miss the P90? 
you've still got this big fat cost there, and suddenly you've got debt to service. That's a, not a nice place to be. As you move to an auction system, as, we, as, as has been discussed, I mean, that, that cost line effectively means you have to bid a higher price to get your returns for your equity. So, so in no way is that good if you're a developer. The shared ownership model, it's really tough for the community, but actually they'll ultimately probably end up better off if they can raise the money. From the developer's perspective, it's not impacting your bid price when you're in these auction schemes. So there's lots of things to consider. Communities, of course, we saw in the research this morning, they much prefer the traditional community benefit model because it's simple, it's easy to understand, and nobody has to do any work. They're really nice. Um, but they're not better off doing that in general in Scotland. Let's do a back of fag packet because one of the things we're seeing in the UK is that um, projects are getting bigger, and that's because uh, subsidies are disappearing, so you need the economies of scale of a nice big project. So let's take a bog standard, unsubsidized 60 meg wind farm, uh, 72 million pounds of capex, give or take. Senior debt, maybe 50% at the moment, give or take. Um, wholesale power, that's not assuming any um, special PPAs. Sponsor equity, they've given, the sponsors very generously given the community a 25% share in that wind farm. So the community is uh, looking for quite a lot of money, 9 million quid. So how many communities are there in Scotland or indeed in Ireland that have 9 million quid in their back pocket? Well, very few. The other problem for the community is this, right? You all, you all know this, right? Developers in the room will know this. That's what your returns look like on a wind farm if you've got a 10-year debt facility. Because you spend 10 years spending all your money repaying your debt. Suddenly you get a whacking great in income because your DSRA gets released. And then you get the nice steady rising um, dividends coming out the back end because suddenly your debt service disappeared. Brilliant. From the community's perspective, that's a nightmare because the community wants 9 million quid to in invest in a shared ownership project. And they need to go to somebody who will come on to you later, but they need to say to the funder, well, guys, um, so over the long term, we think we might make kind of 10% return, but actually the first 10 years are pretty skinny. So can we sort of sculpt the payments that we give you so that, so that you don't take too much then, because otherwise you know, we might dip into negative cash flow. It's a difficult conversation to have. So that's... That, that picture is the big issue with shared ownership projects for communities. Yes, they'll end up better off, but it's all back end. Um, we don't, you, know, you know about project returns, you don't need to know about Scottish ones. Um, other issues for communities in these sorts of deals, um, subordination, so they are typically subordinated to the senior debt, not surprising. Um, from a funder's perspective, that's got risk return implications, so they'll demand a higher return because of higher volatility of income. Lack of control. It's normally the case that in these sorts of deals you have um, a joint venture agreement between the community and the majority partner where control will be pretty much with the majority partner. There'll be a list of reserved matters, um, but it'll be a pretty short list. So the community basically has no power. Uh, lack of security, uh, volatility of income, you know, all that stuff. Where do you get money? Um, very quickly, in order of increasing attractiveness. So the least attractive, developer loan. Um, these are horrible. The reason they're horrible is because they just create conflicts and distrust between the community and the developer. So yes, it's been done before. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time negotiating between developers and communities for deals where they've done them in the distant past. It all started off very friendly. There's been a couple of lean years, a couple of bad wind years, or stuff has happened that wasn't expected. Suddenly there's lots of conflict and the community is saying, well, hang on, I'm paying 10% on this loan and that's not fair. And then you have to start reopening agreements, reopening project finance, it's a nightmare. So that's a last resort in my humble opinion. Um, commercial loans, these are tough to get because of the subordination, because of the lack of control. They're hard. It's possible, but it's hard. Uh, social impact investors, this is a great source of funding in the, in the UK for these types of projects. So it's people like... Um, Big Issue Invest, Charities Aid Foundation, Esme Fairbairn, Joseph Roundtree, those really nice big charitable organisations, they've all got investment arms, they love the social impact of these kind of projects, and importantly, their returns are likely to be low enough that even after paying the 4 to 6%, the community gets a return. And that's, that's really important, because the returns for communities in these projects are thin, and if they have to borrow to get that return, they need to borrow as cheap as possible. 
So that's a great one. Community share offers, these are really good for small projects. Um, certainly in the UK, anything over about two million, um, and you'll, you'll struggle. Uh, but they're great for smaller projects. Uh, typically four to six percent interest, really good for local engagement as well. Because what you can do is you can have a very big community share offer, but you can give preference to people within a certain radius of the wind farm or the hydro or whatever it is. So that's a really nice uh, little extra, extra benefit. Um, a local authority, I've only put this in because it's something to think about. In the UK, we have something called the Public Works Loan Board, which provides unbelievably low cost funding to councils and um, I suspect is in danger of being reformed pretty soon because I think it's there are some schemes that are close to abuse at the moment. Um, however, there have been examples of local authorities that have gone out and used this money to get consent and finance renewable energy projects in the UK. And you could argue that's a community scheme because the local authority is using that cheap funding, it's getting a great return, and that's all going back into public services. So that's a really interesting model. I don't know if it's possible here, but I thought I'd flag it because it's interesting. I've got some case studies, you can read them later. I'm gonna talk about one of them. Not that one, not that one, that one. Um, this is an amazing success story. Uh, 2012, uh, the Nielsen Development Trust was offered the opportunity to invest up to 50% uh, in this 10 megawatt wind farm that they can see from their village hall. Um, the developer was Carbon Free Developments, which is a private renewable energy developer. It's a group of five individuals. They all made a lot of money in doing other things. Um, Pauline Gallagher, who is, if you can imagine the human embodiment of a hurricane, that's Pauline Gallagher. She spent a year phoning people up to try and raise money for this. Raised a million quid in the end and bought 28% of that wind farm. Um, that enabled the community then to have an income stream over the subsequent five years. And they did very well out of that. They used the money for some fantastic projects. They bought an electric van. They set up a bike hire business and a bike repair business. All kinds of great stuff. Um, in late 2016, the senior developer, Carbon Free, got a telephone call saying, we want to buy this wind farm. So the first thing they did was they phoned up the community and said, guys, what do you think? The community got in touch with CARES, um, and CARES said, well, you need to go and talk to Simon, um, because this is, you know, this is cash flow modeling, and you, know, you guys are retired airport executives and things like that, so you need some help. So I went in to see them. Um, I, I actually, there was a bit of a conflict because I was on the board of Nielsen's Development Trust senior charity anyway. Um, but uh, I went in to help them. And, um, and what we worked out was if we did a P50 model of the cash flows that the community could have expected to receive after paying off their debt, and then did a present value of that cash flow, the returns to the community from the wind farm, if they did nothing, were about two million quid. And then we looked at the offer they'd received, and the offer was two million quid. So I said to them, well, guys, you can have that today with zero risk, or you could have it over the next 20 years, and who knows what's going to happen. Easy decision, right? So that went through in record time. Um, where we're left now at Nielsen is they don't have a stake in the wind farm anymore, obviously enough. What they do have is a £2 million legacy fund sitting in that community, which is independently managed and independently operated, and it's been designed so that it will provide an income to the community in perpetuity. So the capital doesn't get eroded, and they're sitting there spending the income from that money on community projects forever. So that's a fantastic story. <coughs> Chris Morris was saying this morning, we love stories in Scotland because that's the way to get across what is possible with this stuff. That's a great story. I'm going to stop there. Um, you'll get access to the slides. There's lots of other fun case studies in here. And contact details. Thank you.